This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles, on the Rockstar Radio Network. On the show today, you'll find out where book publishing is going and how to take advantage of it. How to identify and avoid publishing predators. What opportunities are emerging as the book trade evolves in new forms? How to avoid losing money and much, much more. Join us now as a variety of publishing pros will deliver insights and strategies to take the author to the next, next level of publishing. It's your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Brought to you by Author You and The Book Shepherd on the Rockstar Radio Network. And now, here's your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Well, it's clear that summer is finally coming. At least we don't have snow in Denver. At least the sun is out. And we're starting to finally get leaves on our trees. So I'm absolutely hopeful that we will have summer. Uh, Leaving my guest today is actually from the Bay Area of Northern California, where I'm from originally before I moved to Denver 20 plus years ago. And I still miss summer, summer, and mostly sun because it's in my blood. But with that, Let's say we're getting into storytelling today, and we're going to be looking at what's known as the the proper category is narrative nonfiction, and that how do you re- really create, how do you craft that story that will really grab your audience, that will turn it into when a reviewer picks up your book, this is a page turner. Um, how do you really you know interject humor into your writing? Because I'm a firm believer, even when it's just god awful what's going on there has got to be some relief here and there and lisa alpine is written several books uh, one of the books that she sent me was her fiction uh book called exotic life laughing rivers dancing drums and tangled hearts and it's a collection of a lot of stories she's also a travel writer and she does workshops and uh, one of the workshops she'll tell us a little bit about if for those of you who are in in northern california you might want to make your way there but let's let's bring her on board she has won many book awards including the uh, the, the best women's adventure memoir uh for the from the bapa which is the bay area independent publishers association and lisa glad to have you on your guide to book publishing i'm glad to be here my favorite topic yeah yes well here we go well let's let's jump into that because what caught my attention um, is always the issue that I have with authors who are members of Author You here. Uh, well, we, we have members all over the country, but that they, uh, when we do workshops, whether it's our annual event in May called the Extravaganza or our book camps or some of the other things, that there there is this almost like a you can draw a line between the fiction people and the nonfiction people, and it's not so much the nonfiction people that throw up that line; it's the fiction. Uh, mm. writers that throw up the line because they don't believe that there is a commonality, that there there is a separation. And to me, the only really difference I see between fiction and nonfiction, besides the fact that there's a lot more, heck of a lot more storytelling in fiction, is the whole arena of that when it comes to publicity, it is easier for people with nonfiction to get publicity. And what the, the best thing that could ever happen for a fiction book is an event that absolutely ties in with their storyline or their genre which will help them out there. I mean, Tom Clancy just, you know, looks forward to the next crisis so he can get back on the air. <laughs> so so let, let's just really kind of jump into that and that you talk about a variety of things when it comes to storytelling and that it, it involves, uh, one of the things you talk about is just the whole style of storytelling. So tell, tell me about that. Yeah, a good story is a good story, whether it be fiction or nonfiction. And truthfully, a lot of fiction books do originate with the writer's experiences in life that they have then either taken part of or an idea from and then fictionalized it. And that is interesting so that 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 really blurs the line between the two forms. Just a note before I start speaking about what creates a good story – uh, what's interesting with nonfiction is it's supposed to be the truth. So yeah. I can't blur that line. I'm, I'm beginning <laughs> to really like fiction <laughs> for that reason. Well, as you know, though, sometimes some nonfiction does turn into fiction. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. And then they've got, then they're in the news, maybe not for reasons that they want to be. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so so a good story. What is a good story? What gets a reader or a person that you're telling your story to or somebody has been telling you a story? What grips our attention and what makes us dissolve so that our ego and our mind isn't sitting there listening. We are in the story. It's just like a good movie. We dissolve and we become the characters. Uh, that is the crucial, for me, the crucial crossover point in my trying to write a really good story is I get myself out of the way and yet my character, I, I, I always tell my students in my writing workshops, you want to be the E Y E and not the I. I did this and I did that. It's it's a more um, I don't know how to say it. It's a inward and an outward at the same time personification of experience, so the reader can 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 really feel it and experience uh, that the ups, the downs, the sadness, the happiness, all the things that make a, a life very rich and a story very rich. So the U, U, E-Y-E stands for what in your jargon? Well, E-Y-E, like the I. You want to be the all-seeing I, the visual, the scene setting. <laughs> when okay. you go to a, a really good movie and you're sitting in the chair, if the movie is enthralling, you're going to dissolve from that chair and go into the script, be the story. Almost instantaneously, if I find myself still sitting there 10 minutes, half an hour down the line, aware that, you know, my phone is vibrating or my fingernail, you know, I've got an itch or something, that means I haven't been swept up. So they haven't captivated me with a sensual, one of the big keys in, in bringing a story to life when I write is sensual detail using all five senses. And, and uh, that is the writer's uh, real work, is to, to delve deep into what was the exact smell of the wind before the storm hit. What was the feeling? So those are the things that I really encourage in myself and also in the students I work with, too. To so it's, it's what, you know, not only did what did the wind smell like, what did it taste like? Was it gritted with dirt as it passed through your eyes and that kind of yes. thing? It's yeah. three-dimensional. It, it, makes a, it makes the scene or in the, and the experience three-dimensional by hyping and amping up the sensual detail. Uh, what, what's interesting in our culture, in American culture, is we come from a, a, this is an interesting little twist, but we come from a puritanical background. So we're still, even in the San Francisco Bay Area, when I teach, I can say when I say sensual detail, something all of a sudden, or I say weave a sensual tapestry, you can see people getting a little uncomfortable. They don't realize I'm speaking about the five senses and awaking that as descriptive ability. And, so, uh, you know, Lisa, this that's a, I see a lot of the, the first time fiction writers and they do get caught up. Uh, I mean, they have a decent story. They really do, but they are so mm -hmm. caught up with telling versus yes. showing. Yeah. If that makes sense. Completely. And, and it, it always, um, I wish I could find some magic one line formula to transition them so they, they can get there. Mm, I know what you mean. And it's diligence. It's ripping the veil away, that separation, that sense of separation that they're telling a story. They're sitting back and telling a story. Uh, but it's not engaging the reader. It's we have to put our blood into these stories, our our mm -hmm. not just our intellectual power to to pick out the perfect nuggets of description and the perfect metaphor that resonates without any thought. Where the reader doesn't need to think about what's being said; they just see it or they feel it. That so what? What the writer has to do, uh, I think, that might help some of our listeners mm -hmm. in this, is what the writer has to do is they have to create the storyline, the words on the page, that a director of a movie can mm -hmm. read and know what color, what sense, what feel, what yeah. fabric, what tactile, whatever it is that he or she needs to lay out so that the movie seer can actually be there and yeah. done that. 
Yeah, the, actually, that's a very good technique is to study uh, script writing. Yes. Uh, that's an actual good assignment for a writer of uh, fiction and nonfiction also because there's no waste. They'll turn a 700-pound or 700-pound page like Shogun, let's say, and they'll make a two-hour movie out of it. How yeah. much did they have to cut out, but how much did they have to amp up to bring it to life? So I look well, that's a that's a great technique because um, I'm a big believer in finding the uh, the movie scripts uh, mm -hmm. be, because there are tons of them that are actually free that you can go to oh. and, and go into the databases. You can go to the Internet Movie Script Database, the IMSDB, oh. IMSDB, that's an M like in Mary, and you can download free uh, free scripts. That's free, 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 free. You can look up at movies, uh, almost, uh, unbelievable thousands of movies for free at the IMSDB. IMSDB.com site. So I would highly recommend that with what Lisa's just said, that will get you so to a level that you haven't thought of. And you need to think of all this, and a lot, a lot of our listeners may not even know, most movie scripts are no more than 120 pages. Brilliant. Yeah. That is brilliant. That's a brilliant tip, I've got to say. So, so when you think about that, is that when you've do it, taking Lisa's example of Shogun, which is a you know a mammoth read, which I have read, <laughs> um, and you read that, and and how does that baby get get condensed yeah. down to yeah. 120? Or I think Shogun actually went more than two hours, but how do you how do you condense that baby down to less than 200 of double space, very you know very wide margin with 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 single line descriptors going in? And if you've ever looked at movie script, treat yourself because it will make a difference. I, I would recommend – I'm going to do this this week. I'm going to download one of those movie scripts to a film that I really like or a book that I really yeah. enjoy. And I'm going to watch the movie and read the script and possibly if I really want to carry this a uh, tad farther in my learning curve – I would read the book also again, and I think that is an accelerated learning curve on how to increase your your uh, your storytelling, how to move a story forward, which most writers, that's where they get stuck initially, mm -hmm. is the story doesn't move forward. They swirl around explaining everything. I, I have right. to always, And with that, yeah. we're going to come right, we'll come right back and we'll get into explaining and, and and do that, but we want on scripts. We're talking about the storyline and how to create them that really sing for mm -hmm. your reader. This is Judith Bryles. Lisa Alpine is my guest. <laughs> This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these on the Rockstar Radio Network. Is there a book in you or another author you will show you how to create, develop, and publish your book without being good with it? If you already have a book out, you'll find a supportive and brainstorming community that's connected and creative no matter where you live. Author U brings in national experts for its book camps and annual author extravaganza held each May. It has regular meetings and delivers webinars for its members on timely topics. Through Author U's extensive network, members enjoy exclusive benefits, including significant discounts for a variety of services necessary to publish. The Resource, its online book publishing news magazine, is content-heavy and it's free. If you want to create a book that has possessed as punch and panache. Author U is for you. If you're a hobbyist or a casual author, it's not. Join Author U today through its website at authoru.org. Follow Author U on Twitter at Author U and on Facebook at Author U, where timely author and publishing tips and articles are posted daily. Author U, where the author goes to become seriously successful. sell stuff? Do you want to sell books? Lots of them? If yes, you must take credit cards, the most widely used form of payment today. The Free Terminal has created a special program for your guide to book publishing listeners. No contract. All equipment is free. Extremely low rates and no termination fees ever. 
Contact Alan Dean at Alan at thefreeterminal.com or call him at 303-668-6828. The Free Terminal has handled all credit card transactions for both Author U and Judith for over a year. Don't wait another day. Contact Alan at thefreeterminal.com or call 303-668-6828 and tell him you want the no contract Author U deal. Every picture tells a story, and it's a truism that people do judge a book by its cover. Nick Selinger and NZ Graphics have been in the business of producing superior graphic cover design and interior layout for self-published authors, independent and traditional publishers for years. He has developed a reputation for excellent work, fast turnarounds, and best of all, affordable pricing. NZ Graphics also produces e-books and book marketing materials such as posters, sell sheets, postcards, bookmarks, business cards, logos, and more. Books designed for his clients have won multiple book awards including Best Book Award by U.S. Book News, multiple Evie Awards from the Colorado Independent Publishers Association, Indie Book Awards, the San Francisco Book Festival Award, and Freedom Medal Award from Valley Forge. Visit www.nzgraphics.com or call 303-985-4174 for more details about making your book the success it should be. Mention that you are an FOJ, friend of Judith's, and that you heard about NZ Graphics on your guide to book publishing. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask on the Rockstar Radio Network. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, we're deep into the heart of really creating a story in your book, creating a book that's going to be a composite of a ton of stories, one probably giant storyline, but has all kinds of little goodies along its timeline as it gets to its climax or its conclusion or its cliffhanger or wherever we're going with it. And one of the things that Lisa Alpine, my guest and the author of The Exotic Life, plus uh, other travel-related books, and she's also the co-author the self-publishing book camp workbook and Lisa you ought to send that to me and we ought to do that show as well Sounds but good. but that what we ought to we're really doing is talking about the value the incredible deep value of understanding how scripts movie scripts and those those wonderful things like I, I spent this last weekend going to Star Trek in the, into the darkness which I loved but I had to leave the 3D because I can't watch 3D I've discovered so I went into the old-fashioned 2D and was a happy camper. But that uh, when you watch these series of these books, now it's true that sometimes there is a movie that they actually expand and make into a book book. But it's really taking a book, whether it's a 300-page book, a 200-page book, a 700-page book, a 1,000-page book, fill-in-the-blank page book. How about Harry Potter? And you take these books and how they get trimmed and sliced and spliced and 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 shaped lovingly into a visual delight that sometimes you will see hardly any words, but by God you know what's going on. Um, and and so what you do learn with a really great screenplay is how the writer, the script writer, and something oftentimes it is not the author because it's a different type of writing, but how that script writer can bring it down and can take 20 pages and put it into two lines. And that's what Lisa is talking about in this whole idea of the sensual detail that gets that visual delight out that you grasp instantly. You can feel, you can sense, you can smell it. You, you know, you can, you can close your eyes and you can just experience the whole 
um, environment. And that's what she teaches in her work workshops, as well as what she delivers in her books, and is specifically this latest one, The Exotic Life. So, Lisa, you talked about, um, oh, and what I wanted to say, I just want to give everyone a place to go one more time for the free screenplays that you can get. So you just put in your favorite movie. If they don't have it, find another one, because sometimes they haven't been released to use. But there's some wonderful ones. If you go to IMSDB, that is Igloo, Mary, Sam, uh, dog and baker.com or you can also go to simply scripts.com and pick up free ones and and it's it's homework okay so lisa let's jump into what you call the writer's toolbox what are some of the things that we have in there well i believe in imprinting uh these writing techniques into the writer's brain so that when they're writing they come out naturally this means they need to be practiced and developed. And one of the there's about five pieces to the writer's toolbox. Uh, one of them is weaving a sensual tapestry. And what that does is it brings the scene to life or the experience to life, like I've said before, with a reader. They can smell, they can see, they can hear what's going on in the scene, how do they start to, to amp that up, that ability to bring a central description into their writing? Well, in the toolbox, and what we practice is, is we spend 10 minutes on each sense. So what I would do is I would ask the writer uh, to start a story focusing just on the visual, Obviously, other words are going to get tangled in there. The storyline is going to evolve the narrative. But within that, there's a hyper focus on visual description. And we'll do that for 10 minutes. And then I will add in another sense. Let's say sound. What did they hear? What did they, what were the noises of the cars driving over the wet asphalt in the dark? So then, the writer focuses for 10 minutes just on on adding in to the already existing narrative line they've started, uh, sound, and then we work on 10 minutes with uh, smell and taste, all the senses, and then if I'm feeling really extra generous, I'll throw in <laughs> the sixth sense, mm. which you think, oh, what's the sixth sense? We're not... They're, we're not um, I, psychics, but the truth is a lot of the, especially in traveling, a lot of the information we're picking up around us is through our emotional and um, let's call it serendipity, the body, the knowledge. You're, we're picking up information. Does it feel safe? Does, does, does that person's warm smile, do you feel in your gut it's authentic? We have a lot of information that we got from people. And bring that in through the writing is very interesting too because a reader is going to feel that sudden surprise of shock of, oh, the smile. Suddenly there's a, a chill in mm -hmm. the air. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about temperature. We're talking emotional chill. Okay, so bringing all this awareness in. So this is a, a tool in the toolbox, adding sensual description. And I encourage uh, students to practice this several times a week to go out at lunch break and sit on a bench and and um, separate the senses out and write about everything they're seeing and experiencing or using an already existing narrative that they're developing and doing this. And what they'll find, like any exercise, that muscle starts to get developed naturally. And uh, I found it has done nothing but enhance and and create a uh, vivacity to my stories that they didn't have 20 years ago when I, before I started doing this. Well, I think also that, and the sixth sense, this emotional sense is that intuitive sense. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I know that one of the books I'm, one of my for fun books I'm, I'm personally reading right now is Harlan Coben's uh, latest book. And he talks about, uh, you know, he's driving around the corner and all of a sudden a chill goes down his back. His neck is stiffening. He's feeling, you know, he, 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 and he's, and he literally says, I, I'm sensing, I don't see it, but I'm sensing those kind of things. And and I think that when you go through these kind of exercises, you will go back and relook at things and how you read them and you'll see you'll read them differently. You'll have a different experience as you go to it. And for any of our listeners who are right now deep in the depths, whether it's their own writing or maybe someone else's writing, why don't you read it with tuning into what do you sense, you know, what do you hear, what do you feel, you know, what do you smell? 
Oh, you know, what do you, what do yeah. you literally smell when you, when you can, can you reach out and touch something um, with this and all those things I think are critical. Yeah. As we, yeah. One, as one we of do the that. exercises I do is I ask on Sundays that my, uh, especially my travel writing workshops that the students get the New York times Sunday travel section and analyze the stories that are published in it. Mm-hmm. Does the author use the senses and to circle all the places in there where they're describing something from a sensual standpoint or perception. Um, the other really important uh, piece that uh, novice writers tend to be a little weak in is dialogue, bringing the place to life through the people and what they're really saying, not what we think they're saying or putting words in their mouth, but capturing the cultural nuances of really good dialogue. Cheryl Strayed's book, Wild, is mm-hmm. she's a master at that. Her characters are hysterical. You never know what they're going to say. And she's really captured that form of, of character, uh, the characters bubbling, bubbling with personality just by what comes out of their mouth. Mm-hmm. And and what the beauty of dialogue is, mm-hmm. you get to you get to break so many rules because this is where <laughs> your characters get to have their absolutely true voice. I mean, and yes. look at be real. How many people speak in perfect articulate? Grammar, articulate. Oh, they screw oh. it all up. And and you get to develop your characters and with with whatever you, you know you've made their Bible as, but you develop those characters and they can ha- have screwed up words they can have oddball sayings they can uh, i think you know uh, ziva i mean i love ziva in ncis the tv show she's always screwing stuff up and it's perfect yeah it, it, it what it does is it for me then instead of every character in the book being a creation of a subset of myself and my experiences in life, they stand out as unique and completely separate. You can, it differentiates all the different players in the storyline when there's a lot of character involved and how to get the dialogue. Up. One of the things in the toolbox that I put in for uh, my writing workshops is to go out at lunch break during the workshop and go and get quotes and create dialogue with people. Go start a conversation with a stranger and you'll be surprised. What is everybody's favorite subject? Mm-hmm. And that's and so stuff. critical. Absolutely. Yes, so, <laughs> so you know, you think, oh, nobody's going to talk to me. No, the truth <laughs> is, is they're just dying for somebody to ask them some personal questions. And they'll just, like a horse out the gate, you'll start getting w- unbelievable revelations and humor uh, when you show interest in somebody else. So, so I- important. All right. We're going to come right back. We have a call in from Louis, so we'll pick up his call. And then we have Charlie Floppa with us. This is Judith Riles. You're listening to your guide to book publishing. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Riles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these on the Rockstar Radio Network. Since 1987, Color House Graphics has set the standard for quality book production. Whether you decide to print a small quantity of books or need a large print run, depend on Color House to help you. You'll receive professional help and advice the moment you reach one of our representatives. If you mention hearing about us on your guide to book publishing with Judith Bryles, we will provide you with a discount on the first order you place. To speak with a project manager, call us toll-free at 800-454-1916 or visit us at www.colorhousegraphics.com. When Ned Thompson and Harry Shore started Thompson Shore in 1972, they believed employees with great character would make up the best company. They were right. They hired people who were not only experts in bookmaking, but who were obsessed with quality and delivering exceptional customer service. Almost 40 years later, Thompson Shore remains a 100% employee-owned company. 
Ned and Harry knew that successful customer projects are a direct result of empowered employees. We specialize in all books for large and small publishers. Creating beautiful and well-made books, we're dedicated to pleasing our customers by making the experience a good one from start to finish. The personal touch we have with our customers allows us to be innovative in solving their most difficult challenges. Our platform also ensures that we can remain flexible to meet our customers' unique needs and expectations. Our marketing kit can create buzz for your title, enhancing the promotion of your book during infancy. When you need to test the market to gauge your future sales, we can provide digitally printed books that will transition seamlessly into a larger offset run. From ebook to hard copy to delivery, our skillful customer service teams are at the ready to answer your most pressing question. At Thompson Shore, we know that making the highest quality books requires more than just best technologies. It requires superior customer service, professionalism to the trade, and commitment to environmental and social values. With these standards of excellence in place, you can be sure that we will always help you put your best book forward. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask on the Rockstar Radio Network. Coming up, you'll hear more about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, so fiction. Everyone loves a great read. I love a good read. In fact, my gift to myself after I finished writing one of my own books is that I give myself a month to read trash. And to me, trashy books are murder mysteries. That's what my choice of reading is, getting into a really just great mystery, and we take it from there. And what's so critical is so... so having that scene set that I am immediately there. And, of course, in most of those cases, you either have the murder happen pretty quick or there's such a fast build-up, bang, it's there. And then you see either it's going to be a who done it, or you know who they did it, and it might have another storyline that goes off with it. Um, so, But there's a variety of things in that area. So, Lisa, we're back, we're back to our uh, writer's toolbox. So we have these exercises that we're doing. All right, and yeah. we have those five exercises. So what else is in the toolbox? Well, we've got central chemistry, and we've got quotes and dialogue, and then injecting levity and humor. And okay, so when, when you, let me come back to the dialogue. Oh, okay. So, all right, on the dialogue, are there, there, do you have some tips, techniques that you would suggest for that? Oh, yes. Um, just on a basic structural level, um, mm-hmm. And this also ties into studying scripts. Bridges, bridges in scenes are really important. And bridging dialogue is is that we tend initially to make it very complicated. While standing on the on the dock, he said as he waved goodbye. No, too complicated. He said, "Let the dialogue be the focus." And and um, sometimes it's just a simple. One word clean, does it really represent the person's personality, what they would really say? Mm-hmm. And then other times it's really important to get that full-blown flavor of the boiled-down stew of words that leads. The, the dialogue can actually not only highlight a character, but also let the character say what the drama of what's going to happen next. Instead of saying, it was very dangerous standing there under the full moon uh, beside the raging river. Instead, have the character, uh, well, in one case, I'm thinking specifically in one of my stories, an Apache policeman comes up behind me and says, out of nowhere, have you seen the dead guy? And this really happened in a rafting, rafting scenario. Mm-hmm. But it was, I let the, the uh, Apache policeman be the deliverer, the messenger of this may not be as vacation-y as we thought it was going to be. There's danger. So I also like the characters to introduce uh, sort of oh, dun, 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 dun. murder mystery should do this really well. You know, dun, mm-hmm. dun, 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 and then let the, either the emotion say, let the emotion come through in what the character says, uh, the sadness, the sorrow, the pain, or the joy and delight, 
or the confusion. Should, uh, when we use dialogue to do that, to deliver that instead of explaining mm-hmm. a scene, it's so powerful. It is powerful, and I think that what you have to look at with dialogue, and, and again, the great way to, re- to really start, I think, learning dialogue is you pay attention that to is. the dialogue in the book and the genre that you love so mm-hmm. you, can, you can really get the flow yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think the best writers, how they become better writers, is one, they keep on writing, but two, they read, they're just ferocious with their ferocious. reading themselves. That's a commonality among great writers, definitely. Yeah. It is. Okay, let me take a, we're going to take a quick break. We've got Charlie Plaffa with us, and usually we have our sponsors on at the bottom of the hour, and we had a a couple of hiccups in getting hold of them. So Charlie is going to come on, and uh, he's with Total Printing Systems, and one of the things that I like about Total Printing, because a lot of authors literally uh, want to create ARCs, or what we call advanced reader copies. And one of the things that that Total Printing does so well is create an ARC quick and a very reasonable rate. Hi, Charlie. How are you? Hi, Peter. How are you? Great to be back. Uh, Having a great day. Yep. Great. So, what's new in ARC land? Well, I tell you, we we at Total Printing Systems we do manufacture a lot of ARCs for publishers and authors alike. Uh, Our quantity set is usually at 25 books and up. And uh, the nice thing about ARC, you can see a, a PDF proof. And then within a week, we'll have uh, books for you to look at, and uh, you can distribute them to editors and uh, then make final revisions and go back to, to press for any quantities. We're pretty efficient anywhere from, you know, 25 books up to a few thousand. Uh, we do wow, have that's, all that's, that's, <laughs> that sounds like an offset printing run. <laughs> you, you know what? It, it happens because we use, for our text, we're using digital and jet webs. Uh, we're one of the few people that... that do produce our, our text either by sheetbed or by digital web. And the nice thing about what's happened this year is we have some great new stocks that are uh, gloss enamels or satin finish that run on digital inset web. And the color is there, the resolution is great, but that, there's a huge cost savings over digital toner uh, compared to digital inset. Uh, so you can add color to text. Uh, we're doing a lot of cookbooks and children's books, uh, and then, along with you know a lot of single color books also. But it's an opportunity to add color at a very reasonable price. Okay, so let me ask you this, Charlie. On on the uh, your your matte finish, which I I prefer matte finishes actually on covers and on gloss, but that on a a book that you're doing with color throughout, what are the cost factors? What is what's the difference between just that your our, our normal black and white and your and your four color throughout? Well, the, and the, the nice the, thing the, about on digital on a digital web is you don't you're not paying uh, four color press pricing uh, on every page. If you have a 160-page book and, uh, you know, 100 of the pages are single-color black and then the rest are color, you're only paying those color pages on that that other uh, 60 pages. So I'm not an estimator, and I I don't want to throw out numbers that are incorrect, but say your average page was uh, a nickel a page for a 160-page book. You could probably add color to those other pages. So maybe, you know, Maybe eight cents and eight or nine cents a page just on those those pages, as long as you use the same stock. And the, the actually the cost for the gloss or the satin is the same. Okay, so what we have to do is, I mean, people need to realize that if they're using color um, uh, on their on their text is that they have to make sure that the paper you talk to the printer, you talk to the paper that it it, it has uh the what's what's the absorbing factor because sometimes as you know paper can just suck up ink like crazy and it exactly. may not be the colors that you're looking at. Actually the the uh the choice of the paper for color uh is this as important as the resolution. Uh you know we print it at a high or low res depending on the product. If somebody has a product that is, is not a coffee table book or something that they mm-hmm. want color on it, but it's not, it's a dated piece maybe, it isn't going to be around forever, they can add color at a, at a lower res, at a higher press piece, and save quite a bit of money. Now, if it's a children's mm-hmm. book or cookbook, something you would literally slow the press down, bring the resolution up, and mm-hmm. uh, you have great quality. 
Yeah, I, I know that you did a, a run for a client that we referred you to of, a, I think it was 1,000 or 2,000 books that had a, an, another color in it, and it came out just fine. Well, with that, Charlie, thank you for being with us. Total Printing Systems, what's the website? It's tps1.com. TPS1, that's the letter, the number 1.com. Thank you, and we'll look forward to seeing you at next year's extravaganza at Author U. Thank you. We had a great time, and look forward to seeing you again. Bye. Great. All right. Bye, Charlie. All right, Lisa, we're back to you, and we've got about three minutes before we have our final break. So we were we just kind of took a jump from dialogue, and then you were talking about, was it adding humor at this yes. point? Yeah, okay. Yes. All right. Humor, don't you love it when you read in suddenly and get and laugh at either the character's behavior or what they said? Uh, it warms the reader up if they laugh. And it oh, gets yes. them, I said, you've got to make them laugh before you can make them cry. Yeah. And I like the juxtaposition of humor also, unless it's a straight out humor piece like David Sedaris. Um, mm -hmm. I like humor to be the springboard into the deeper emotions more uh, that juxtaposition, that flip side of pleasure and pain, which so many stories revolve around. Um, so laughing and how to laugh, how, how do, most people don't even realize they're writing funny. And it's very hard to try to write funny. It's more an internal dialogue you're having as the scene unfolds and it comes out on the page, your own personal quirky sense of humor mm -hmm. um, that starts to get built into, let's say, a character or a character's behavior. Uh, but most writers don't realize they've got it when they're novices. So when we're reading our work out loud within the writing workshops, I always tell them to make note of when people chuckle or laugh at what they just read. And hopefully it's not because it's so bad, but because it's funny. And to start acknowledging this humor bone that warms people up to what's going to happen next in the story. Well, I love the idea of the humor bone because, I mean, it, it really is real. And I think uh, there's a couple of great examples. And I know when I first, when I read my first Janet Ivanovich book the, mm -hmm. on the Stephanie Plum, that I, I was on a plane. I found, I, I didn't know who she was and I picked it up and I read it. I was looking for, you know, a fast read between flights and it was, you know, on sale. So I grabbed it in the bookstore at the airport and I was reading through it. I mean, I started laughing that loud. I mean, I had a woman walk literally. Mm -hmm from the back of the plane up she said what are what you are reading, you reading? <laughs> yeah she you know. wanted the title <laughs> you no know, she wanted the title now i have to say i don't think that her more recent books are as humorous as her earlier books but she did have a gift of setting number one she said of these ridiculous scenes that you you know that you could see it with a twinkle in your eye and that's what you know that lisa's talking about is is this setting up using the humor finding the funny bone and sometimes you don't even recognize that you got it yeah and it, it's very important to develop if you have a tendency a propensity to be funny to write funny scenes where somebody trips over something and then falls into the love of their, the arms of the love of their life making a total fool of themselves ah so, yeah <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, what's interesting with humor is the okay well when we come back to that we'll find out what's really interesting um, with humor as well as a couple of other tips in the toolbox for writers i'm judith browse my guest is lisa alpine and you're listening to your guide to book publishing <laughs> This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these on the Rockstar Radio Network. Do you sell stuff? Do you want to sell books? Lots of them? If yes, you must take credit cards, the most widely used form of payment today. The Free Terminal has created a special program for your guide to book publishing listeners. No contract, all equipment is free. Extremely low rates and no termination fees ever. Contact Alan Dean at Alan at thefreeterminal.com or call him at 303-668-6828. The Free Terminal has handled all credit card transactions for both Author You and Judith for over a year. Don't wait another day. Contact Alan at thefreeterminal.com or call 303-668-6828 and tell him you want the no contract Author You deal. The 
Shepherding concept is simple. The publishing world is changing, and so must you. You need an experienced shepherd and a guide to partner with you as you create, strategize, develop, publish, and achieve your publishing goals. You can't do it alone without paying the price. You can spend your money creating a book that turns out to be so-so, or you can create a book that looks and feels classy, builds your brand, and is a financial success, a bestseller. It's your choice. You choose. You need the book shepherd. Publishing is riddled with obstacles, sometimes nightmares for the author. You don't need problems. You want solutions. Dr. Judith Bryles will shepherd you through the maze and the chaos. At times, she's had to step in and rescue a book, a book that has been sabotaged by a publisher or by a publishing service provider or sometimes even the author themselves. Judith Bryles is the book shepherd. If you want to create a book with no regrets, give her a call today, 303-885-2207. That's 303-885-2207 or email her at judith at bryles.com. By the way, Bryles is spelled B-R-I-L-E-S. Follow Judith on Twitter at My Book Shepherd and on Facebook at The Book Shepherd. At Total Printing Systems, customer service is our priority. We are located in Southern Illinois. Our employees have an average of 18 years' experience and know that customer relationships are important to our continued success. We have been a short-run book printer for nearly 40 years and always stay at the forefront of technology. Our niche is from 1 to 5,000 copies. Today, we offer digital black and white and four-color high-speed inkjet printing, a cost-effective way to introduce color into your short-run titles. We, of course, offer traditional offset printing as well. Bindery is done in-house, from adhesive case binding to PUR perfect binding to mechanical binding of all types, including side sewing. We provide warehousing, kitting, distribution, inventory management, a new print-on-demand facility, streaming browser-based ebooks, and bookstore. Call us at 1-800-465-5200 for a quote on your next book project. You can also visit our website at www.tps1.com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask on the Rockstar Radio Network. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, so in our last segment with me is Lisa Alpine, and we're talking fiction or narrative nonfiction, um, as, as it's formally known as, but the, really the creation of it. And she's been going through some of the elements of her writer's toolbox. Um, and we, we've talked about setting the scene. We've talked about the whole issue of the central tapestry, the, the, you know, what's really going on versus what's thinking going on and, and some of the d- dialogue components. And, and we just kissed on humor. And, and there's a couple of other components I think we really need to look at is how do you deal with twists and turns? How do you create those? How do you set those up yeah. and move them out? And also, I think that's important, Cheryl, or uh, Lisa, is we are just talking offline about one of the, <laughs> the authors by the name of Cheryl, who's doing extraordinary well, um, that what's really important is to how do we take um, uh, take and maybe manipulate or use some of those tidbits that are out there in history or oddball facts that maybe you can drop in and make it look like, but we all know it's wink, wink, not. Yeah. You, I'm always interested in encouraging not just a humor within a piece to warm the reader up, but also hot, what I call hot starts. Mm-hmm. And a hot start is something that grabs, just like a good movie, it grabs your attention immediately. Now, this is a stylistic approach. It may not work for every writer. Some some writers warm up the engine slowly, build the scene slowly, slowly, slowly. But because of my love of the short story, which means you've got a shorter period of time to tell your story, I like hot starts. Get out the gate fast. Um, sometimes they're ribald. They're a little. They're they're quirky. Um, it, they're unexpected. It could be. Oh, I love starting a story with dialogue. 
Welcome to Jamaica, where all is juicy, said Juice, our tour guide, and blah, blah, blah. This was a travel story I wrote about Jamaica. That was the lead to my story on Jamaica. He captured, he was funny, he captured the spirit of Jamaica, and he said something. He kept saying all these very outrageous things that were just, I couldn't have made them up. Mm -hmm. So I do like hot stars. And what I found in the writing exercises in class and in people when they bring their stories for me to analyze, a lot of writers... Again, they're warming up the engine, so the start of the story really is on page two. And that whole page and a half, the beginning two pages, 400 words, whatever, they're just getting going to where the story actually starts. So as an, a writer, can you find the start, the starting line, and not, not bore your readers to death before you even get them? Don't have them sit down in their chair. You want them standing up in their seats with the binoculars waiting for the horse to leap out of that starting gate. Mm -hmm. and, so that's a that's a practice. Uh, one of the practices in my writer's toolbox is developing hot starts. So so in developing a hot start, it means you're not passive. You're not a voyeur. <laughs> active verbs using active verbs, not starting sentences with the I. I did this and I did that. Start with the verb. Uh, running across the street, the truck. Uh, came uh, the, the truck blew my hair back instead of I ran across the street and almost got hit by the truck so mm -hmm. it's always turning it around and putting the active verb in the front end of the story so that there's an uh, there's a feeling of of immediacy Mm -hmm. And and you know what we're talking about here, Lisa, is that you know we're we're talking fiction. But I'm let me cross over to what my expertise is, which is nonfiction, mm. and that I believe it is critical for a nonfiction author to uh, get off the point of the tell me, tell me, tell me, and you, know, you need to incorporate good stories to do the tell you part. Um, for it. So what Lisa's talking about is you start with that hot start and you make it action and verb. And it's not so much at what one of my button pushers is a lot of authors in the nonfiction arena, all we, they, they write with, we suggested, we did this, us, la, yeah. la, 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 la. And, and then they use I. It's okay to use I if you're the expert saying, here's what I would recommend, blah, 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 blah. But I think that it's very important that, that for your, it's, it's you. I mean, you're giving them advice. You're solving their problems. Here's the solution to what is ailing you, baby. Uh, and it's, so it's for you. So, but storytelling is critical in that component. Yeah, and in keeping it interesting. Not, not uh, it's just like cooking. When you make a really good stew, you put in all the, the ingredients and the savories, and the spices and the herbs, and then you cook it down. You don't just serve it right away. You have to cook it down. And so cooking a story down, and I do mostly nonfiction, by the way, nonfiction, short stories, narrative, short mm -hmm. stories. That's my specialty. But it's just boiling it down, boiling it down to where the story pops and has flavor and the reader walks away feeling like they ate a really good meal and they want to turn a page and read the next story. Well, I think that you've had to learn how to really doing it with your expertise as a travel author. Yeah. As yeah. well, because you really have to set the visual scene that they want to go there. I mean, you want people to pick up your book and say, I am booking a trip. <laughs> <laughs> and these days, luckily, it, there was a huge transformation in travel writing starting about 30 years ago when I became a travel writer. Uh, was it stopped being the we and the authoritative I and became more about the people and the place mm -hmm. and more personal stories, suddenly experiences instead of press releases, uh, not writing in the third person. There was a huge transition in travel writing, and it's why I even went into it, because up until that point, I found, unless it was journals of fabulous conquistador explorers or a woman, uh, Frida Stark, or somebody like that who would dress like a man and go to Tibet and have these big adventures, uh, in general, travel writing and destination pieces were boring. They were just press releases for cruises or whatever. So this new style of travel writing, and it, uh, there's a crossover genre now where um, my stories end up not just in travel anthologies, but in anthologies about the beauty of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, I'll, it, there's a, a whole broader market now to these stories. It's not just about going to Bolivia and traveling in the Andes. It's about 
the ancientness of the tradition of this, these Aymara Indians and how they're living like they used to live and how I can be absorbed into their lifestyle, what my experience was. So, so I'm very pleased with that. And, and that is why this toolbox has been developed over time with my own writing and the past beyond other writers. It, it brings a place to life and an experience to life for the readers. All right, any other any other tips that you would leave about three minutes here? Any other okay. tips that you we can incorporate for involving in researching or That's exactly in, what I was gonna talk about. Incorporating okay. useful, interesting and unique details that include bits of history, politics, science. Uh, obviously People don't want to read a whole, unless they're historians, uh, a whole historic piece on who created the Eiffel Tower, uh, what year, what it was made of, all that stuff. But they do want to know factoids, quirky, maybe perhaps relevant factoids where they feel like they're learning about a place or a situation and how to pepper those in into a story to bring it to life. And the other thing I really emphasize is name Everything. Don't call it a tree. Was it an elm tree? Is it a birch tree? Because that gives a visual, an actual visual for the person to see. And um, was it an, was it a, a young birch tree? Was it a weeping birch tree? Was the sap coming attached from the bark? I mean, what you yes, have to start doing is let them be there. God is in the details when you write. <laughs> I love that phrase. I know. <laughs> I'm going to write that down. God is in the details. When you write. And then that means when you research, I'm very uh, vigilant to make sure that the language spoken of right now, I, I just finished a story today called Two Mohammeds about taking my young son. He was a baby, eight months old, to uh, the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. And we went to the Michio Betrothal Fair. It was a, it was a humorous story and it's also about a place most people will never get to uh, but I had a lot of specific details I wanted to make sure I got right the kinds of crystals that we saw in the caves the language spoken by that specific tribe in the middle atlas mountains uh, all these I really I encourage writers to be uh, not just diligent enjoy and savor the research because you're learning along with the reader. Exactly. Specific details. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. You know, all of that. All right. So we have about 30 seconds here mm. um, as we get ready, as we move to closing out. So any last minute tip that you want to give? Oh, I would encourage people to continue to write and write and write. I always tell people I'm going to be a great writer when I'm by the time I'm 80, so <laughs> they'll say, oh, you're a great writer now. I said, no, 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 no. I want to be a great writer. And it's going to take a daily step-by-step -step chewing on those words, telling those stories. And uh, also, I encourage writers to join a writer's group. Create one with just one other person, perhaps, or a larger group online or in person. Invite people to your house. We, I used to lure people to my writer's group by cooking them dinner and serving wine. Nothing, nothing. I mean, you know what? I think that's a great way to do to, so to speak, noodle over things. But but that's really how we learn is you keep doing that and it, it, you do it over and over and over again. And I know that my first book came out in 81. The writer I am today is nowhere near the amateur I was 30 years ago. And with that, we want to thank Lisa Alpine. You can find her at her website. Lisa, what is it quickly? LisaAlpine.com. LisaAlpine.com. This is Judith Riles. You're listening to your guide to book publishing. We'll see you next week. Thank you for being a part of your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryle.